The UCC Connection, How to Free Yourself from Legal Tyranny Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Proverbs 3.13 We the people, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This article has really filled in the voids that kept me from fully understanding things. I have found it to be one of the best discussions on the subject of freedom and how our own government has managed to take that freedom away from us, all the while giving lip service to the Constitution. The title of this article is The UCC Connection. The noteworthy author is Howard Freeman. It is dated September 22, 1991. The UCC Connection, How to Free Yourself from Legal Tyranny by Howard Freeman. Forward. This is a slightly condensed, casually paraphrased transcript of types of a seminar given by Howard Freeman in 1990. It was prepared to make available Mr. Freeman's knowledge and experience in his search for an accessible and understandable explanation of the confusing state of the government and the courts. It should be helpful to those who want to develop a deeper understanding of this information without having to listen to three or four hours of recorded material. The frustrations many Americans feel about our judicial system can be overwhelming and often frightening, and like most fear, it is based on the lack of understanding or knowledge. Those of us who have chosen a path out of bondage and into liberty are faced, eventually, with the seemingly tyrannical power of some governmental agency and the mystifying and awesome power of the courts. We have been taught that we must get a good lawyer, but that is becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible. If we are defending ourselves from the government, we find that the lawyers quickly take our money and then tell us, as the ship is sinking, I can't help you with that. I'm an officer of the court. Ultimately, the only way for us to ever have a snowball's chance is to understand the rules of the game and to come to an understanding of the true nature of the law. The lawyers have established and secured a virtual monopoly over this area of human knowledge by implying that the subject is just too difficult for the average person to understand. And by creating a separate vocabulary out of English words of otherwise common usage, while it may at times seem hopelessly complicated, it is not that difficult to grasp. Are lawyers really as smart as they would have us believe? Besides, anyone who has been through a legal battle against the government with the aid of a lawyer has come to the realization that lawyers know procedure, not law. Quote, Then answered one of the lawyers, and said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers! For ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. In parentheses, Christ teaches his disciples at Luke chapter 11, verse 45 through 52. Besides, Anyone who has been through a legal battle against the government with the aid of a lawyer has come to the realization that lawyers learn about procedure, not about law. Mr. Freeman admits that he is not a lawyer, and as such, he has a way of explaining law to us that puts it well within our reach. Consider also that the framers of the Constitution wrote in language simple enough that the people could understand specifically so that it would not have to be interpreted. So again we find, as in many other areas of life, the buck stops here. It is we who must take the responsibility for finding and putting to good use the truth. It is we who must claim 
and defend our God-given rights and our freedom from those who would take them from us. It is we who must protect ourselves, our families, and our posterity from the inevitable intrusion into our lives by those who live parasitically off the labor, skill, and talent of others. To these ends, Mr. Freeman offers a simple, hopeful explanation of our plight and a peaceful method of dealing with it. Please take note that this lecture represents one chapter in the book of his understanding, which he is always refining, expanding, improving. It is, as all bits of wisdom are, a point of departure from which to begin our own journey into understanding, so that we all might be able to pass on to others greater knowledge and hope, and to God, the gift of lives lived in peace, freedom, and praise. I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. In parentheses, Matthew, chapter 10, verse 16. Introduction When I beat the IRS, I use Supreme Court, in parentheses, SC decisions. If I had tried to use these in court, I would have been convicted. I was involved with a Patriot group, and I studied Supreme Court cases. I concluded that the SC had declared that I was not a person required to file an income tax, that that tax was an excise tax on privileges granted by government. So I quit filing and paying income taxes, and it was not long before they came down on me with a heavy hand. They issued a notice of deficiency, which had such a fantastic sum on it that the biggest temptation was to go in with their letter and say, where in the world did you ever get that figure? They claimed I owed them some $60,000, but even if I had been paying taxes, I never in the world had that much money, so how could I have owed them that much? Section 1 Never argue the amount of deficiency. Fortunately, I had been given just a little bit of information. Never argue the facts in a tax case. Maxim, arguments are for fools. If you're not required to file, what do you care whether they say you owe $60 or $60,000? If you are not required to file, the amount doesn't matter. Don't argue the amount. That is an issue of fact. In most instances, when you get a notice of deficiency, it is usually for some fantastic amount. The minute you say, I don't owe that much, you have voluntarily agreed that you owe them something, and you just have given them jurisdiction. Just don't be shocked at the amount on a notice of deficiency, in parentheses, N-O-D, even if it's $10 million. If the law says that you are not required to file or pay tax, the amount doesn't matter. By arguing the amount, they will just say that you must go to tax court and decide what the amount is to be. By the time you get to tax court, the law issues are all decided. You are only there to decide how much you owe. They will not listen to arguments of law. So I went to see the agent and told him that I wasn't required to file. He said, you are required to file, Mr. Freeman. But I had all these Supreme Court cases and I started reading them to him. He said, I don't know anything about law, Mr. Freeman, but the code says that you are required to file, and you're going to pay that amount, or you're going to go to tax court. I thought that someone there ought to know something about law, so I asked to talk to his superior. I went to him and got out my Supreme Court cases, and he wouldn't listen to them. I don't know anything about law, Mr. Freeman. Finally, I got to the problems resolution officer. And he said the same thing. He said that the only person above him was the district director. So I went to see him. By the time I got to his office, 
They had phoned ahead, and his secretary said he was out. But I heard someone in his office, and I knew he was there. I went down the elevator, around the corner to the federal building, and into Senator Simpson's office. There was a woman sitting at a desk, and she asked me if she could help. I told her my problem. I said that I really think the district director is up there. I asked her to call the IRS and tell them that it was Senator Simpson's office calling and to ask if the district director is in. I said, if you get him on the phone, tell him that you are from the senator's office and you have a person whom you are sending over to speak to him. If he is, can he wait just five minutes? It worked. He was there. So I ran back up to his office. His secretary met me when I came in and said, Mr. Freeman, you're so lucky. The director just arrived. The director was very nice and offered me coffee and cookies, and we sat and talked. So he asked me what I wanted to talk to him about. In parentheses, if you've never had someone say to you, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Watch out. But we can turn that around and approach them in the same way. So I said, I thought you ought to know that there are agents working for you who are writing letters over your name that you wouldn't agree with. Do you read all the mail that goes out of this office over your signature? The director said, oh, I couldn't read everything. It goes out of here by the bagful. In parentheses, that was what I thought. I said, there are some of your agents writing letters which contradict the decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States, and they're not doing it over their name. They're doing it over your name. He was very interested to hear about it and asked if I had any examples. I just happened to have some with me, so I got them out and presented them to him. In parentheses, Supreme Court cases supporting Freeman's position. The director thought it was very interesting and asked if I could leave this information with him, which I did. He said he would look it over and contact me within three days. Three days later, he called me up and said, I'm sure, Mr. Freeman, that you will be glad to know that your notice of deficiency has been withdrawn. We've determined that you're not a person required to file. Your file is closed and you will hear no more from us. I haven't heard another word from them since. That was in 1980, and I haven't filed since 1969. Mm -hmm. Section 2. The Supreme Court on Trial mm -hmm. I thought sure I had the answer. But when a friend got charged with willful failure to file an income tax, he asked me to help him. I told him that they would have to prove that he willfully failed to file and I suggested that he should put me on the witness stand. He should ask me if I spoke at a certain time and place in Scott's Bluff, and did I see him in the audience. He should then ask me what I spoke about that day. When I got on the stand, I brought out all of the Supreme Court cases I had used with the district director. I thought I would be lucky to get a sentence or two out before the judge cut me off but I was reading whole paragraphs and the judge didn't stop me. I read one and then another and so on. And finally, when I had read just about as much as I thought I should, the judge called a recess of the court. I told Bob I thought we had made it. There was just no way that they could rule against him after all that testimony. So we relaxed. The prosecution presented its case and he, in parentheses Bob, decided to rest his case on my testimony, which showed that he was not required to file and that the Supreme Court had held this position. The prosecutor then presented his closing statements, and we were just sure that we had won. But at the very end, the judge spoke to the jury and told them, you will decide the facts of this case, and I will give you the law. The law required this man to file an income tax form. You decide whether or not he filed it. What a shock. The jury convicted him. As soon as the trial was over, I went around to the judge's office, and he was just coming in through his back door. I asked Judge if 
By what authority do you overturn the standing decisions of the United States Supreme Court? You sat on the bench while I read that case law. How do you, a district court judge, have the authority to overturn decisions of the Supreme Court? He says, oh, those were old decisions. I said, those are standing decisions. They have never been overturned. I don't care how old they are. You have no right to overturn a standing decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in a district court. Section 3. Public Law vs. Public Policy He said, Name any decision of the Supreme Court after 1938 and I'll honor it. But all the decisions you read were prior to 1938. He went on, Prior to 1938, the Supreme Court was dealing with public law. Since 1938, the Supreme Court has dealt with public policy. The charge that Mr. S. was being tried for is a public policy statute, not public public law. And those Supreme Court cases do not apply to public policy. I asked him what happened in 1938. He said that he had already told me too much. He wasn't going to tell me anymore. Section 4. 1938 in the Erie Railroad well, I began to investigate. I found that 1938 was the year of the Erie Railroad v. Tompkins case of the Supreme Court. It was also the year that the courts claimed they blended law with equity. I read the Erie Railroad case. A man had sued the Erie Railroad for damages when he was struck by a board sticking out of a boxcar as he walked along beside the tracks. The district court had decided on commercial law in parentheses, negotiable instruments law, that this man was not under any contract with the Erie Railroad. Therefore, he lacked standing to sue the company. Under common law, in parentheses, natural law, he was damaged, and he would have had the right to sue. This overturned a standing decision of over 100 years. Swift v. Tyson in 1840 was a similar case. And the decision of the Supreme Court then was that in a case of this type, the court would judge by the common law, in parentheses natural law, of the state where the incident occurred. In this case, Pennsylvania. In the Erie Railroad case, the Supreme Court now ruled that all federal cases will be judged under the negotiable instruments law. There would be no more decisions based on the common law at the federal level. So here we find the blending of law with equity. This was a puzzle to me. As I put these new pieces together, I reasoned that all courts since 1938 were merchant law courts and not common law courts. There were still pieces missing from the puzzle. Section 5. A Friend in Court Fortunately, I made a friend of a judge. Now, you won't make friends with a judge if you go into court like a wolf in black sheep country. You must approach him as though you are the sheep and he is the wolf. If you go into court as a wolf, if you make demands and tell the judge what the law is, how he had better uphold the law or else. Remember the verse, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We have to go into court and be wise and harmless and not make demands. We must be humble, in parentheses, and play a little dumb and ask a lot of questions. Well, I asked a lot of questions and boxed the judges into a corner where they had to give me a victory or admit what they didn't want to admit. I won the next case, and on the way out, I had to stop by the clerk's office to get some papers. One of the judges stopped and said, You're an interesting man, Mr. Freeman. If you're ever in town, stop by, and if I'm not sitting on a case, we will visit. Section 6. America is Bankrupt Later, when I went to visit the judge, I told him of my problem with the Supreme Court cases dealing with public policy rather than public law. He said in 1938, all the higher judges, the top attorneys, and the U.S. attorneys 
were called into a secret meeting. And this is what we were told. America is a bankrupt nation. It is owned completely by its creditors. The creditors own Congress. They own the executive. They own the judiciary and they own all the state governments. Take silent judicial notice of this fact, but never reveal it openly. Your court is operating under admiralty jurisdiction. Call it anything you want, but do not call it admiralty. Section 7. Admiralty Courts The reason they cannot call it admiralty jurisdiction is that your defense would be quite different in admiralty jurisdiction from your defense under the common law. In Admiralty, no court has jurisdiction unless there is a valid international contract in dispute. When you know it is Admiralty jurisdiction, and they have admitted on the record that you are in an Admiralty court, you can demand that the international maritime contract to which you are supposedly party and which you supposedly have breached be placed into evidence. No court has admiralty forward slash maritime jurisdiction unless there is a valid international maritime contract that has been breached. So you say, just innocently like a lamb, well, I never knew that I got involved with an international maritime contract, so I deny that such a contract exists. If this court is taking jurisdiction in admiralty, then place the contract into evidence so that I might challenge the validity of the contract. What they would have to do is place the national debt into evidence. They would have to admit that the international bankers own the whole nation and that we are the bankers' slaves. Section 8. Not Expedient but the bankers said it is not expedient at this time to admit that they own everything and could foreclose on every nation of the world. This is the key behind the buildup of the United Nations as a military force. This is the key to disarming America. This is the key to ending the Cold War. Like now we have no more enemies, so we can melt all our guns, right? Wrong. The bankers plan to foreclose. They just don't want their heads blown off while doing it. So they dictate to Congress to get rid of the guns, etc. The reason they don't want to tell everyone that they own everything is that there are still too many privately owned guns in America today. There are uncooperative armies and other military forces. So, until they can gradually consolidate all armies into a world army and all courts into a world court, it is not expedient to admit the jurisdiction of the courts they are operating under. When we understand these things, we realize that there are certain secrets they don't want to admit, and we can use this to our benefit. Section 9 Jurisdiction. The Constitution of the United States mentions three areas of jurisdiction in which the courts may operate. Section 10. Common Law. Common law, in parentheses natural or constitutional law, is based on our Creator's laws as originally presented by Moses. Any time someone is charged under the common law, there must be a damaged property. You are free under the common law to do anything you please, as long as you do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. You have a right to make a fool of yourself provided you do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. The common law does not allow for any government action which prevents a man from making a fool of himself. For instance, when you cross the state line, you will probably see a sign which says, Buckle your seatbelts. It's the law. This cannot be common law because who would you injure if you did not buckle up? Nobody. This would be compelled performance. But 
Common law cannot compel performance. Any violation of common law is a criminal act that is punishable. Section 11. Equity Law Equity law is law which compels performance. It compels you to perform to the exact letter of any contract that you are under. So, if you have compelled performance, there must be a contract somewhere and you are being compelled to perform under the obligation of the contract. Now, this can only be a civil action, not criminal. In equity jurisdiction, you cannot be tried criminally but you can be compelled to perform to the letter of the contract. If you then refuse to perform as directed by the court, you can be charged with contempt of court. This is a criminal action. Are our seatbelt laws equity laws? No, they are not, because you cannot be penalized or punished under equity jurisdiction for not keeping to the letter of a contract. In brackets, this has, of course, changed since the publishing of this article. So read on. Section 12. Admiralty or Maritime Law Admiralty is a civil jurisdiction of compelled performance, which has criminal penalties for not adhering to the letter of the contract. But this only applies to international contracts. Now we can see what jurisdiction the seatbelt laws, in parentheses, and all traffic laws, building codes, ordinances, tax codes, etc., are under. Whenever there is a penalty for failure to perform, in parentheses, such as willful failure to file, that is admiralty forward slash maritime law, and there must be a valid international contract in force. However, the courts don't want to admit that they are operating under admiralty forward slash maritime jurisdiction. So they took the international law or law merchant and adopted it into our codes. This is what the Supreme Court decided in the Erie Railroad case, that the decisions would be based on commercial law in parentheses or business law, and that there will be criminal penalties associated with it. Since judges were instructed to not call it admiralty maritime law jurisdiction, they call it statutory jurisdiction. I looked for statutory jurisdiction in the fourth edition of the Black's Law Dictionary. It's not there. So I looked up statute, and under its definition is this paragraph. This word is used to designate the written law in contradistinction to the unwritten law. Foster v. Brown, 199, GA 444, 34, capital S, period E, period 2, D, 530, 535, C, common law. Unwritten law is common law. Contradistinction means as opposed to, opposite to. Section 13. Courts of Contract. You may ask how we got into this situation where we can be charged with failure to wear seatbelts and fined for it. Isn't the judge sworn to uphold the Constitution? Yes, but you must understand that in Article 1, Section 10, the Constitution gives us the unlimited right to contract, as long as we do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. Contracts are enforceable, and the Constitution gives two jurisdictions where contracts can be enforced, equity or admiralty, but we find them being enforced in statutory jurisdiction. This is an embarrassing part for the courts that we can use to box the judges into a corner in their own courts. We will cover this more later. Section 14. Contracts must be voluntary. Under the common law, both parties must enter into every contract knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally, or the contract is unenforceable and void. These are the characteristics of a common law contract. There is another characteristic. The contract must be based on substance. For example, 
Contracts used to read, For one dollar and other valuable consideration, I will paint your house, etc. That was a valid contract. The dollar was a genuine silver dollar. Now suppose you wrote a contract that said, For one Federal Reserve note, in parentheses, FRN, and other considerations, I will paint your house. And suppose, for example, I paint your house the wrong color. Could you go into a common law court and get justice? No, you could not. No substance, no contract. You see, a Federal Reserve note is a colorable dollar as it has no substance. And in a common law jurisdiction, that contract would be unenforceable. Colorable. That which is an appearance only and not what it purports to be, hence counterfeit, feigned, having the appearance of truth, in parentheses Black's Law Dictionary, 5th edition. Section 15. Colorable Money and Colorable Courts. The word colorable means something that appears to be genuine, but is not. Maybe it looks like a dollar, and maybe it spends like a dollar, but if it is not redeemable for lawful money, in parentheses, silver or gold, it is colorable, fiat, fake, false. If a Federal Reserve note is used in a contract, then the contract becomes a colorable contract, and colorable contracts can only be enforced under a colorable jurisdiction. So, by creating Federal Reserve notes, the government had to create a colorable jurisdiction to cover the kinds of contracts that use them. We now have what is called statutory jurisdiction, which is not a genuine admiralty jurisdiction. Judges are enforcing a colorable admiralty jurisdiction because we are using colorable money. Colorable admiralty is now known as statutory jurisdiction. So let's see how we got under this statutory jurisdiction. Section 16. Uniform Commercial Code. The government established a colorable law system to fit their colorable currency. It used to be called the law merchant or the law of redeemable instruments because it dealt with paper, which was redeemable in something of substance. But once Federal Reserve notes had been declared unredeemable, there had to be a system of law which was completely colorable from start to finish. This system of law is codified as the Uniform Commercial Code, in parentheses UCC, and has been adopted in every state of the Union. This is colorable law, used in all of the courts of the nation. I explained one of the keys earlier which is that the country is bankrupt and we have no rights. If the master says jump, the slave had better jump, because the master has the right to cut off his head. As slaves we have no rights, but the creditors, forward slash masters, had to cover up that fact, so they created the system of the law called the UCC. This colorable jurisdiction under the UCC is the next key to understanding what has happened. Section 17. Contract or Agreement One difference between common law and the UCC is that in common law, contracts must be entered into 1. Knowingly 2. Voluntarily and 3. Intentionally Under the UCC, this is not so. First of all, contracts are necessary. But under the UCC, agreements can be binding. And if you only exercise the benefits of an agreement, it is presumed or implied that you intend to meet the obligations associated with those benefits. If you accept a benefit offered by government, you are obligated to follow every statute involved with that benefit. So their method is to get everybody exercising a benefit and they don't even have to tell the people what the benefit is. Some people think it's the driver's license, the marriage license, or the birth certificate, etc. I believe it's none of these. Section 18. The Compelled Benefit 
I believe the benefit being used is that we have been given the privilege of discharging debt with limited liability instead of paying debt with substance. When we pay a debt, we give substance for substance, equal value for equal value. If I buy a quart of milk with a silver dollar, that dollar paid for the milk, and the milk paid for the dollar. Substance for substance, pound for pound. But if I use a Federal Reserve note to buy the milk, I have not paid for it. There is no substance in the Federal Reserve note. It is worthless paper, given in exchange for something of substantive value. Congress offers us this remedy in the form of a benefit. Debt money. Big money. Authorized by the Federal United States can be spent all over the continental United States. It is declared legal tender for all debts, public and private. And the limited liability is that you cannot be sued for not paying your debts when you discharge the charge using this colorable money. So they have said, we're going to help you out. You can discharge your debts instead of paying your debts. When we use this colorable money to discharge our debts, we cannot use common law courts. We can only use colorable law courts. We are under the jurisdiction of the UCC. We are using non-redeemable negotiable instruments and we are discharging debt rather than paying debts. Section 19. Remedy and Recourse Every system of civilized law must have two characteristics, remedy and recourse. Remedy is a way to get out from under the law. Recourse is if you have been damaged under the law, you can recover your loss. The common law the law of the merchants, and even the UCC, all have remedy and recourse, but for a long time we could not find it. If you go to a law library and ask to see the UCC, they will show you a shelf of books completely filled with the UCC. When you pick up one volume and start to read it, it will seem to have been intentionally written to be confusing. It took us a long time to discover where the remedy and recourse are found in the UCC. They are found right in the first volume at UCC 1-207 and 1-103. Section 20. Remedy. The making of a valid reservation of rights preserves whatever rights the person possessed at that time and prevents the loss of such rights by application of the concepts of waiver or estoppel, in parentheses, UCC 1-207.7. It is important to remember when we go into a court that we are in a commercial international jurisdiction. If we go into court and say, I demand my constitutional rights, the judge will most likely say, you mentioned the constitution again, and I'll find you in contempt of court. We don't then understand how we can do that. Hasn't he sworn to uphold the Constitution? The rule here is this. You cannot be charged under one jurisdiction and defend under another. For example, if the French government came to you and asked where you filed your French income tax for a certain year, do you go to the French government and say, I demand my constitutional rights? No. The proper answer is, the law doesn't apply to me. I'm not a Frenchman. You must make your reservation of rights under the jurisdiction in which you are charged, not under some other jurisdiction. So in a UCC court, you must claim your reservation of rights under the UCC 1 hyphen 207, and now change to UCC 1 hyphen 308. Section 21, UCC 1 hyphen 308 goes on to say, When a waiverable right or claim is involved, 
The failure to make a reservation thereof causes a loss of the right and bars its assertion at a later date. In parentheses, UCC 1-308.9. You have to make your claim known early. Further, it says, the sufficiency of the reservation, any expression indicating and intention to reserve rights, is sufficient, such as without prejudice. In parentheses, UCC 1-308.4. Whenever you sign any legal paper that deals with the Federal Reserve notes in any way, under your signature write without prejudice or without prejudice UCC 1-308. This reserves your rights. You can see at 1-308.4 that you have sufficiently reserved your rights. It is very important to understand just what this means. For example, one man who used this in regard to a traffic ticket was asked by the judge just what he meant by writing without prejudice on his statement to the court. He had not tried to understand the concepts involved. He only wanted to use it to get out of paying for the ticket. He did not know what it meant. When the judge asked him what he meant by signing in that way, he told the judge that he was not prejudiced against anyone. The judge knew that the man had no idea of what it meant, so he lost the case. You must know what it means. Section 22. Without Prejudice. UCC 1-308. When you use without prejudice or without prejudice UCC 1-308 in connection with your signature, you are saying, I reserve my right not to be compelled to perform under any contract or commercial agreement that I did not enter knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. I do not accept the liability of any compelled benefit or any unrevealed contract or commercial agreement. What is the compelled performance of an unrevealed commercial agreement? When you use Federal Reserve notes instead of silver dollars, is it voluntary? No. There is no lawful money, so you have to use Federal Reserve notes. You have to accept the benefit. The government has given you the benefit to discharge your debts. How nice they are. But if you have not reserved your rights under 1-308, you are compelled to accept the benefit and are therefore obligated to obey every statute, ordinance, and regulation of the government at all levels of government, federal, local, and state. If you understand this, you will be able to explain it to the judge when he asks. And he will ask. So be prepared to explain this statement to the court. You will also need to understand UCC 1-103, Argument and Recourse. If you want to understand this fully, go to the Law Library and photocopy these two sections from the UCC. It is important to get the Anderson version. Some of the Law Libraries will only have the West Publishing version, which is very difficult to understand. In Anderson, it is broken down with decimals into 10 parts, and most importantly, it is written in plain English. Section 23. Recourse. Recourse appears in UCC at 1-103.6, which says, The code is complementary to the common law, which remains in force except where displaced by the code. A statute should be construed in harmony with the common law, unless there is a clear legislative intent to abrogate the common law, in parentheses UCC 1-103.6. This is the argument to use in court. The code recognizes the common law. If it did not recognize the common law, the government would have to admit the United States is bankrupt and completely owned by its creditors. But it is not expedient to admit this. The code was not written to entirely override the common law. Therefore, if you have made a sufficient, timely, and explicit reservation of rights pursuant to UCC 1-308, you can insist that the statutes be construed in harmony with the common law. 
If the charge is a traffic ticket, you may demand that the court produce the injured person who has filed a verified complaint. For example, if you were charged with failure to buckle your seatbelt, you may ask the court who was injured as a result of your failure to buckle up. However, if the judge won't listen to you and just moves ahead with the case, you will want to read to him the last sentence of UCC 1-103.6, which states that the code cannot be read to preclude a common law action. Tell the judge, Your Honor, I can sue you under the common law for violating my rights under the UCC. I have a remedy under the UCC to reserve my rights under the common law. I have exercised my remedy so you must construe this statute in harmony with the common law. To be in harmony with the common law, you must bring forth the damaged property. Note, actually, it is better to use a rubber stamp, because this demonstrates that you had previously reserved your rights. The simple fact that it takes several days or a week to order and get a stamp shows that you had reserved your rights prior to signing the document. In parentheses, Anderson Uniform Commercial Code, Lawyers Cooperative Publishing Company. If the judge insists on proceeding with the case, act confused and ask this question. Let me see if I understand, Your Honor. Has this court made a legal determination that the sections of 1-308 and 1-103 of the UCC which is the system of law you are operating under, are not valid law before this court? Now, the judge is in a jam. How can the court throw out one part of the code and uphold another? If he answers yes, then you say, I put this court on notice that I am appealing your legal determination. Of course, the higher court will uphold the court on appeal, the judge knows this, so you have boxed him into a corner. Section 24. Practical Application in Traffic Court Just so we can understand how this whole process works, let's look at a court situation such as a traffic violation. Assume you ran through a yellow light and a policeman gave you a traffic ticket. 1. The first thing you want to do is delay the action at least three weeks. This you can do by being pleasant and cooperative with the officer. Explain to him that you are very busy and ask if he could please set your court appearance for about three weeks away. In parentheses, at this point we need to remember the government's trick. I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. So we want to use this approach with them. 2. The next step is to go to the clerk of the traffic court and say, I believe it would be helpful if I talk to you, because I want to save the government some money. In parentheses, this will get his attention. I'm going to appeal this case. As you know, in an appeal, I have to have a transcript. But the traffic court doesn't have a reporter. It would be a waste of taxpayers' money to run me through this court and then have to give me a trial, de novo, in parentheses, new trial, in a court of record. I need a transcript for appealing and to save the government some money. Maybe you could schedule me to appear in a court of record. You can show the date on the ticket and the clerk will usually agree that there is plenty of time to schedule your trial for a court of record. Now your first appearance is in a court of record and not in traffic court, where there is no record. When you get into the court, there will be a court reporter there who records every word the judge speaks, so that the judge is much more careful in a court of record. You will be in a much better situation there than in traffic court. If there is no record, the judge can say whatever he wants. He can call you all sorts of names and tell you that you have no rights and so on, and deny it later. 3. When you get into court, the judge will read the charges. 
driving through a yellow light or whatever, and this is in violation of ordinance XYZ. He will then ask, Do you understand the charge against you? 4. Well, Your Honor, there is a question I would like to ask before I can make a plea of innocent or guilty. I think it could be answered if I could put the officer on the stand for a moment and ask him a few short questions. Judge, I don't see why not. Let's swear in the officer and have him take the stand. 5. Is this the instrument that you gave me? In parentheses, handing him the traffic citation. Officer, yes, this is a copy of it. The judge has the other part of it. Where did you get my address that you wrote on the citation? Officer, well, I got it from your driver's license. In ankle bracket parentheses. Number four above is very important to get into the record, clearly stating that you do not understand the charges. With that in the record, the court cannot move forward to judge the facts. This will be covered later on. In parentheses, handing the officer your driver's license, is this the document you copied my name and address from? Officer, yes, this is where I got it. Well, you've got that in your hand. Would you read the signature that's on the license? In parentheses, the officer reads the signature. While you're there, would you read into the record what it says under the signature? Officer, it says, without prejudice, UCC 1-308. Judge, let me see that license. In parentheses, he looks and turns to the officer. You didn't notice this printing under the signature on this license when you copied his name and address under the ticket? Officer, uh, no, I was just getting the address. I didn't look down there. Judge, you're not very observant as an officer. Therefore, I'm afraid I cannot accept your testimony in regards to the facts of this case. This case is dismissed. Six, in this case, the judge found a convenient way out. He could say that the officer was not observant enough to be a reliable witness. He did not want to admit the real nature of the jurisdiction of his court. Once it was in the record that you had written without prejudice UCC 1-308 on your license, the judge knew that he would have to admit a. that you had reserved your common law rights under the UCC b. that you had done it sufficiently by writing without prejudice UCC 1-308 on your driver's license. C. That the statute would now have to be read in harmony with the common law, and the common law says that the statute exists, but there is no injured party. D. That since there is no injured party or complaining witness, the court has no jurisdiction under the common law. 7. If the judge tries to move ahead, away, and try the facts of the case, you will want to ask him the following question. Your Honor, let me understand this correctly. Has this court made a legal determination that it has authority under the jurisdiction that it is operating under to ignore two sections of the Uniform Commercial Code, which have been called to its attention? If he says yes, tell him that you put the court on notice that you will appeal his legal determination and that if you are damaged by his actions, you will sue him in a common law action under the jurisdiction of the UCC. This will work just as well with the Internal Revenue Service. In fact, we can use the UCC with the IRS before we even get to court. Section 25, Using the Code with the IRS. If the IRS sends you a notice of deficiency, this is called a presentment in the UCC. A presentment in the UCC is very similar to the common law. First, we must understand just how this works in the common law. Suppose I get a man's name from a phone book, someone I have never met, and I send him a bill or invoice or a nice letterhead which says, for services rendered, ten thousand dollars and i send this to him by certified mail 
return receipt requested at the address taken from the phone book. The man has to sign it before he can open it. So I get a green card receipt that he received it. When he opens it, he finds an invoice for $10,000 in the following statement. If you have any questions concerning this bill or the services rendered, you have 30 days to make your questions or objections known. Of course, he has never heard of me. So he just throws the bill away and assumes that I'm confused or crazy. At the end of 30 days, I go to court and get a default judgment against him. He received a bill for $10,000 and was given 30 days to respond. He failed to object to it or ask any questions about it. Now he has defaulted on the bill and I can lawfully collect the $10,000. This is common law. The UCC works on the same principle. The minute you get a notice of deficiency from the IRS, return it immediately with a letter that says, the presentment above is dishonored, in parentheses, your name has reserved all of his rights under the Uniform Commercial Code at UCC 1-308. This should be all that is necessary, as there is nothing more they can do. In fact, I recently helped someone in Maine who received a notice of deficiency. The man sent a letterhead such as this, dishonoring the presentment. The IRS wrote back saying that they could not make a determination at that office, but were turning it over to the collections department. A letter was attached from the collections department, which said that they were sorry for the inconvenience they had caused him, and that the notice of deficiency had been withdrawn. So you can see that if it's handled properly, these things are easily resolved. Section 26. Impending Bankruptcy. On my way here, I had a chance to visit with the government of. He is very concerned that if he runs for office this November, that there won't be a state at the end of four years. He believes that the international bankers might foreclose on the nation, and officially admit that they own the whole world. They could round up everybody in the state capitol building, put them in an internment camp, and hold them indefinitely. They may give them a trial, or they may not. They may do whatever they want. As I explained earlier, it has not been expedient to foreclose on the nation until they get everything ready. This is where the Federal Emergency Management Agency comes in. It has been put in place without anyone really noticing it. Section 27. FEMA FEMA, or the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has been designed for when America is officially declared bankrupt, which would be a national emergency. In a national emergency, all constitutional rights and all law that previously existed would be suspended. FEMA has created large concentration camps where they would put anyone who might cause trouble for the orderly plan and process of the new regime to take over the nation. Even a governor could be thrown into one of these internment camps and kept there indefinitely. This is all in place now, and they are just waiting to declare a national emergency. Then even the state governments could be dissolved. Anybody who might oppose the new regime could be imprisoned until the new set of laws could be written and a new government set up. The governor knows all of this, and he is very concerned. He doesn't want to be in office when all this happens. I, in angle bracket parentheses, Harold Freeman, visited with him, and I told him that there are certain actions we should take right now. I think that we should consider the fact that, according to the UCC, each state is an accommodation party to the national debt. To understand this, we must realize that there are two separate entities known as the United States. Section 28. The Rothschild Influence. When America was founded, the Rothschilds were very unhappy because it was founded on the Christian common law. The common law is based on substance, and this substance is mentioned 
in the Constitution as silver and gold. America is a constitutional republic, which is a union of the states under the Constitution. When Congress was working for the republic, the only thing Congress could borrow or issue was silver or gold. And the Rothschild banks did not lend silver or gold. Naturally, they did not like this new government. The Rothschilds had a deal with the King of England. The King would borrow paper and agree to repay in gold. But these United States, with their constitution, were an obstacle to the Rothschilds. It was much to their advantage to get the colonies back under the king. So the Rothschilds financed the War of 1812 to bring America back under the British crown. It didn't work as planned, so they had to find another way. Section 29. The Flaw in the Constitution. Two Nations in One. Around the time of the American Civil War, they discovered a flaw in the Constitution. The flaw was Article 1, Section 3, Clause 17. Remember, there are two nations called the United States. What is a nation? See if you agree with this definition. Whenever there is a governing body having a prescribed territory containing a body of people, in angle bracket parentheses, this is an easy to understand restatement of the definition presented in Black's Law Dictionary. Is this a nation? Yes, we have a governing body in the Republic, a three branch government, legislative, executive, and judicial branches under a constitution. We have a prescribed territory containing a body of people as a constitutional republic. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 gave Congress, in parentheses, the legislative branch of the three branch government, exclusive rule over a different territory containing a body of people, in parentheses, District of Columbia. Here we have a nation within a nation, a legislative democracy within a constitutional republic. When Congress was part of a constitutional republic, it was obligated to provide a medium of exchange for the people. Its duty was to coin silver and gold. Anyone who had a piece of silver or gold could bring it in and have it freely minted into silver or gold coin. This was the medium of exchange for the Republic. But in the legislative democracy, in parentheses over Washington, D.C., Congress is not limited by the Constitution. Congress has exclusive rule over the District of Columbia and its people. The legislators in the District of Columbia can make the laws by a majority vote. Because the District of Columbia is a democracy wherein their administrative agents enforce their own laws. And the administrative courts in their government try their own laws. Here we have the legislator making the law, enforcing the law and trying the law, all within one branch of government. This is a one-branch government within a three-branch government. Under the three-branch government, Congress passes laws which must be in harmony with the Constitution. The executive enforces these laws passed by Congress, and the judiciary tries these laws passed by Congress pursuant to the Constitution. The three-branch constitutional republic and the one-branch legislative democracy, both called the United States. One is the continental United States. The other is the federal United States, in parentheses, federal zone. Section 30. Are you a United States citizen? If you say that you are a United States citizen, which United States are you referring to? Anyone who lives in the District of Columbia is a citizen of the United States. The remaining population in the Union of the 50 states are national citizens of the nation. We are domiciled in the various sovereign states and protected by the constitutions of those states from any direct rule of Congress over us. 
In the democracy, anyone who lives in the states known as Washington, D.C., Guam, Puerto Rico, or any of the federally held territories is a citizen of the United States, D.C. We must be careful with our choice of words. We are not citizens of the United States. We are not subject to Congress. Congress has exclusive rule over a given territory, and we are not part of that territory. Where did Congress get the authority to write the International Revenue Code? It is found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. To pass that law, they only needed a majority vote. There is no other way that they can pass laws directly affecting individuals. Title 26 in the Internal Revenue Code was passed as law for a different nation. In parentheses, remember our definition of nation. Title 26 is not consistent with the Bill of Rights. If you try to fight the IRS, you have no rights. The IRS Code does not give you your constitutional rights. It simply says, you failed to file an income tax form. You failed to perform in some specific manner. Remember, under the common law, you are free to do whatever you want to do as long as you do not infringe upon the life, liberty, or property of anybody else. If you do not want to perform, you don't have to. The only way you can be compelled to perform under the Constitution of the Continental United States is if you have voluntarily entered into a contract. But, if you are not under a contract, you cannot be compelled to perform. You cannot be compelled to file an income tax form. When Congress works for the Republic, every law it passes must be in harmony with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But when Congress works for the legislative democracy, any law it passes becomes a law only over federal territory. If you are charged with willful failure to file a 1040 income tax form, that form is of and for a different nation. You're a non-resident alien of that nation. It is a foreign corporation to you. It is not the Republic of the Continental United States coming after you. It is a foreign nation, the legislative democracy of a foreign nation coming after you. If you get a notice of deficiency from the IRS, it is a presentment from the federal United States. So you can use the UCC to dishonor it. And you can tell the IRS that you are among the national citizenry of the continental United States. That you are a non-resident alien to the federal United States. You never lived in the federal zone, in parentheses a federal territory and you have never had any income from the federal United States. Furthermore, you cannot be required to file or pay taxes under the compelled benefit of using the Federal Reserve notes, because you have reserved your rights under the common law through UCC 1-308. Section 31. Original Intent of the Founders The Founding Fathers would never have created a government that was going to boss them around. There were 13 sovereign states. They were nations which they joined together in union for protection from foreign enemies. They provided the means by which the union of sovereign states could fend off foreign and domestic enemies. But they never gave the Congress of the Federal United States direct rule over any citizen of any union state. They were not going to be ordered around by the government that they set up. Section 32. Federal Region. The Federal Zone. The Supreme Court has declared that Congress can rule what Congress creates. Congress did not create the states, but Congress did create federal regions. So Congress can rule the federal regions, but Congress cannot rule the states. How have we been tricked into federal regions? Section 33. The Zip Code Trick Remember how the government always comes to use and says, 
I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you out. The government went to the various states and said, We don't want you to go to all that trouble of writing three or four letters to abbreviate the name of your state, such as Ariz, A-R-I-Z, for Arizona. Just write all capital letters A-Z instead of capital A, regular R-I-Z. Or you could just write capital W-Y for Wyoming instead of W-Y-O. So all the states of the Union have been given new two-letter abbreviations. Each of states, such as Rhode Island, has a new abbreviation, all capital letters R-I, instead of R, period, I, period. They just left off the periods. When you use a two-letter state abbreviation, you are compelled to use the zip code, in parentheses, the Zone Improvement Code, because there are many states which start with the same letter, for example, all capital M, E. M, E is Maine. Capital M, I is Michigan. Capital M, S is Mississippi. With capital M, A, capital M, O, capital M, N, capital M, S, etc. And some sloppy writing and you could not tell one from another. So we used the zip code in order to tell them apart. But if you wrote capital M in lowercase I-C-H, or capital M lowercase I-N-N, or capital M lowercase I-S-S, there would be no problem telling them apart. There's no harm in using the zip code. If you lawfully identify your state, I found out that no state legislator has met to lawfully change the abbreviation of their state from its old abbreviation to the new. Therefore, if you do not use the lawful abbreviation for your state, but use the new legal shorter abbreviation, you have to use the zip code. Look on page 11 of the zip code directory. It will tell you that the first digit of your zip code is the federal region in which you reside. If you use capital A-Z for Arizona, you cannot use the state constitution to protect you because you did not lawfully identify your state. You use the zip code, which identifies which federal region you live in. Congress may rule federal regions directly but it cannot rule the citizen of any state. Section 34. Accommodation Party Let's look at how the states have become the accommodation party to the national debt. Many people who I have talked to, including the governor, are very concerned about this and know that it could happen very soon. If America is declared a bankrupt nation, it will be a national emergency. FEMA will take over, and anyone who opposes the creditor's new government can be sent to a detention camp in Alaska. We will have no rights whatsoever. They have already set up prison camps with work camps nearby so the people can be used for slave labor. It could be the governors, legislators, and other leaders who would be hauled away to Alaska while the people, now disenfranchised from power, would likely be chosen to run the new government. This could all happen very soon, and the national debt is so large as to be unpayable, even the interest on the debt is virtually unpayable. As I explained, the national debt, more than $3 trillion, now $30 trillion, is not owed by the continental United States, it is owed by the federal United States that was given the authority to borrow bank credit. When Congress worked for the continental United States, it could only borrow silver and gold. Therefore, the national debt was borrowed by the federal United States. The federal United States had to trap the states into assuming the debt obligation of the federal debt. In the UCC, we find the term accommodation party. How did the states become the accommodation party to the federal debt. The federal government 
forced the states to deal in Federal Reserve notes, which means that everything that the states do and have done is colorable. Under the colorable jurisdiction of the UCC, all of the states are accommodation parties to the federal debt. The concern now is to find out how we can get out of this situation. I told the governor that in the common law and the law of merchants, in parentheses, the international law merchant, there's a term called no interest contract. A no interest contract is unenforceable and void. What is a no interest contract? Section 35. No interest contract. If I were to insure a house that did not belong to me, that would be a no interest contract. I would just want the house to burn down. I would pay a small premium, perhaps a few hundred dollars, and insure it for $80,000 against the fire. Then I would be waiting for the house to burn down so I could trade my small premium for $80,000. I would have no interest in living in or owning the house. Under the common law, this is called a no interest contract, which is unforceable in any court and therefore void. Section 36. Unconscionable Contracts No interest contracts are called unconscionable contracts. The section in the Anderson Code on unconscionable contracts covers more than 40 pages. The federal United States has made each state an accommodation party to the federal debt, which could be proven to be an unconscionable contract. We should get some litigation into the courts, in parentheses, before the government declares a national emergency, claiming that this state has no lawful responsibility for the national debt, in parentheses, of the federal United States, because it became an accommodation party to this debt through an unconscionable, no-interest contract. If we have this litigation before the courts under international law, when the nation is declared bankrupt, the creditors would have to settle this matter, and it would delay them. They would want the new government to appear legitimate, so they could just move right in and take over the state because it would be an international court. This is very important at this time. Section 37. Questions in Review Note. There are some of the questions asked after the main lecture. Some are restatements of material presented earlier, but they contain valuable information worth repeating. Section 38. Courtroom Techniques. Q. How did you box in the judge? A. This is easy to do if you don't know too much. I didn't know too much, but I boxed them in. You must play a little dumb. If you are arrested and go into court, just remember that in a criminal action, you must understand the law, or it is a reversible error for the court to try you. If you don't understand the law, they can't try you and have to dismiss the case. In any traffic case or tax case, you are called in a court and the judge reads the law and then asks, do you understand the charges? Defendant, no. No, Your Honor, I do not. Judge, well, what is so difficult about the charge? Either you drove the wrong way on a one-way street or you did not. You can only go one way on that street, and if you go the other way, it's a $50 fine. What's so difficult about this that you do not understand? Defendant, well, Your Honor, it's not the letter of the law, but rather the nature of the law that I don't understand. The Sixth Amendment to the Constitution gives me the right to ask the court to explain the nature and cause of any action against me, and upon my request, the court has the duty to answer. I have a question about the nature and cause of this action. Judge, well, what is that? What do you want to know? Defendant, well, Your Honor, is this a civil or criminal action? Judge, it is criminal. In parentheses, if it were a civil action, there could be no fine, so it has to be criminal. Defendant, thank you, Your Honor, for telling me that. 
then the record will show that this action against, in parentheses, your name is a criminal action. Is that right? Judge. Yes. Defendant. I would like to ask another question about this criminal action. There are two criminal jurisdictions mentioned in the Constitution. One is under the common law, and the other deals with international maritime contracts under admiralty jurisdiction. Equity is civil, and you said that this is a criminal action. So it seems it would have to be under either common law or maritime law. But what puzzles me, Your Honor, is that there is no corpus delecti here to give this court jurisdiction over my person and property under the common law. Therefore, it doesn't appear that this court is moving under common law. Judge, no, this court is not under the common law. Defendant, well, thank you, Your Honor, but now you make the charge against me even more difficult to understand. The only other criminal jurisdiction would apply only one. If there was an international maritime contract involved, two, I was a party to it, three, it had been breached, and four, the court was operating in an admiralty jurisdiction. I don't believe I have ever been under any international maritime contract, so I would deny that one exists. I would have to demand that such a contract, if one does exist, be placed into evidence so that I may contest it. But surely this court is not operating in an admiralty jurisdiction. You just put the words in the judge's mouth. Judge, no, I can assure you, we're not operating in an admiralty jurisdiction. We're not out in the ocean somewhere. We're right here in the middle of the state. No, this is not an admiralty jurisdiction. Defendant, thank you, Your Honor. But now I am more puzzled than ever. If this charge is not under the common law, nor under admiralty, and those are the only two criminal jurisdictions mentioned in the Constitution, what kind of Constitution could this court be operating under? Judge, it's statutory jurisdiction. Defendant, oh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm glad you told me that, but I have never heard of that jurisdiction. So, if I have to defend myself under that jurisdiction, I would need to have the rules of criminal procedure for statutory jurisdiction. Can you tell me where I might find such rules? In parentheses, there are no rules for statutory jurisdiction, so the judge will get very angry at this point and say, Judge, if you want answers to questions like that, get a licensed attorney. I'm not allowed to practice law from the bench. Defendant. Oh, Your Honor, I don't think anyone would accuse you of practicing law from the bench if you just answered a few questions to explain to me the nature and cause of this action so I can defend myself. Judge, I told you before, I'm not going to answer any more questions. Do you understand that? If you ask any more questions in regard to this, I'm going to find you in contempt of the court. Now, if you can't afford a licensed attorney, the court will appoint one for you. But, if you want those questions answered, you must get a licensed attorney. Defendant, thank you, Your Honor, but let me just see if I got this straight. Has this court made a legal determination that it has the authority to conduct a criminal action against me, the accused, under a secret jurisdiction, the rules of which are known only to this court and licensed attorneys, thereby denying me that right to defend myself in my own person? He has no answer for that. The judge will probably postpone the case and eventually just let it go. In this way, you can be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. But you must not go into court with a chip on your shoulder and as a wolf in black sheep country. Remember Jesus' words, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Sheep do not attack wolves directly. Just be an innocent lamb who just can't understand the charge. And remember, they can't try you criminally if you don't understand the charge. That would automatically be a reversible error on appeal. Section 39. The Social Security Problem If I were a young man, 18 or 20 years old, and just starting out in my first job, I would not want Social Security. 
along with my signature on the application I would write, without prejudice, UCC 1-308, to reserve my common law rights. But why wouldn't I want Social Security today? I got into the Social Security system in the 1930s and I paid into it dollars that had good purchasing power. Now I'm getting a promised return in Federal Reserve notes, which have considerably less value. For example, in 1940, you could buy a deluxe Chevrolet automobile for 800 bucks. With today's Federal Reserve notes that won't buy the rear fenders and trunk on a new Chevrolet. If I were a young man, I would not want to put my Federal Reserve notes into Social Security now and get back something later, like the German mark after World War I when it took a billion marks to buy a loaf of bread. They will give you every Federal Reserve note back they promised you, but it might not buy anything. Section 40. Assurance of Performance Under the UCC, you have the right in any agreement to demand a guarantee of performance. So don't go to them and say, I want to resign my SSN, or I refuse to take it. Just go easy and say, I would be happy to get a Social Security number, and enter into this contract, but I have a little problem. How can I have assurance before I enter into this contract that the purchasing power of the Federal Reserve notes I get back at the end of the contract will be as good as the ones that I pay in at the beginning? They can't guarantee that, and you have a right, in parentheses under the UCC, to assurance of performance of the contract. So tell them, well, I cannot enter this contract unless the government will guarantee to me at the end of the contract with the same value Federal Reserve notes that I'm paying in. Both may be called Federal Reserve notes, but you know that these Federal Reserve notes don't hold their value. I want assurance on this contract that the Federal Reserve notes that I get in my retirement will buy as much as the ones I'm giving you now in my working years. They can't make that guarantee. If they won't give you that guarantee, just say, I'd be glad to sign this, but if you can't guarantee performance under the contract, I'm afraid I cannot enter the contract. So did you refuse or did they refuse? You can get the sections of the UCC, which grant the right to assurance that the contract you have entered into will be properly fulfilled, that the return will equal the investment or you can reject the contract using the code. Using their own system of law, you can show that they cannot make you get into a contract of that nature. Just approach them innocently like a lamb. It is very important to be gentle and humble in all dealings with the government or the courts. Never raise your voice or show anger. In the courtroom, always be polite and build the judge up. Call him, your honor. Give him all the honor that he actually deserves. He didn't rise to his position by standing on his thumbs. It does no good to be difficult, but rather be cooperative and to ask questions in a way that leads the judge to say the things which you need to have in the record. Section 41. The Court Reporter In many courts, there will be a regular court reporter. He gets his job at the judge's pleasure so he doesn't want to displease the judge. The court reporter is sworn to give an accurate transcript of every word that is spoken in the courtroom. But if the judge makes a slip of the tongue, he might turn to his court reporter and say, I think you had better leave that out of the transcript. Just say it got a little too far ahead of you and you couldn't quite get everything in. So this will be missing from the transcript. In one case, we brought a licensed court reporter with us, and the judge got very angry and said, This court has a licensed court reporter right here, and the record of this court is this court's reporter's record. No other court reporter's record means anything in this court. We responded with, Of course, Your Honor, we're certainly glad to use your regular court reporter, but you know, Your Honor, sometimes things move so fast that a court reporter gets a little behind and doesn't quite keep up with it all. Wouldn't it be nice if we had another licensed court reporter in the courtroom? Just in case your court reporter got a little behind. 
so that we could fill in from this other court reporter's data. I'm sure, Your Honor, that you want an accurate transcript. In parentheses, I like to use the saying, give a bad dog a good name and he'll live up to it. The judge went along with it, and from that moment on, he was very careful of what he said. These are little tricks to getting around in court. This is how to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove when we enter a courtroom. There are others using the same information presented here who end up in jail, handcuffed, and hit over the head, because they approach the situation with a chip on their shoulder. They try to tell the judge what the law is and that he is a no-good scoundrel, and so on. So just be harmless and wise. Section 42 UCC 1-308 Review It is so important to know and understand the meaning of, without prejudice, UCC 1-308, in connection with your signature, that we go over this once more. It is very likely that a judge will ask you what this means. So please, learn and understand this carefully. The use of without prejudice UCC 1-308 in connection with my signature, indicates that I have reserved my common law right not to be compelled to perform under any contract I did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. And I do not accept the liability associated with the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or commercial agreement. Once you state this, this is all the judge needs to hear. Under common law, both parties must enter into a contract knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally, or it can be declared unenforceable and void. You are claiming the right to not be compelled to perform under any contract that you did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. And you do not accept the liability associated with the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or agreement. The compelled benefit is the privilege to use Federal Reserve notes to discharge your debts with limited liability rather than to pay your debts with silver or gold coins. It is a compelled benefit because there are no silver or gold coins in circulation. You have to eat and you can only buy food with a medium of exchange provided by the government. You are not allowed to print your own money, so you are compelled to use theirs. This is the compelled benefit of an undisclosed commercial agreement. If you have not made a valid, timely, and explicit reservation of your rights under UCC 1-308, and you exercise the benefit of using paper non-Federal Reserve notes offered by the government, you will be obligated under an implied agreement to obey every statute, ordinance, and regulation passed by government at all levels, federal, local, and state. Section 43. Conclusion. The editor of this transcript has taken great liberties in putting this to paper in an effort to make it readable and somewhat compact. He wishes to offer his gratitude to Howard Freeman for the opportunity to work with the information so absolutely vital to our survival as dignified, unenslaved human beings. He also must ask Mr. Freeman's forgiveness for any errors committed in getting to this print. Its purpose, as stated in the foreword, is to make this knowledge and wisdom available to as many people as will take the time to read it. This is meant to be supplemental to Mr. Freeman's recorded lectures, not a substitute. Indeed, there is no substitute for hearing him present this material in his own words. It is not just the law and the facts that are important here, but the way they are used. His numerous reminders of Jesus, commissioned to be like sheep among wolves, cannot be overstated, and is certainly good advice to us, in all dealings not just in court or with the government. Hearing him explain this in his own words brings to life the practical application and usefulness of being harmless and wise. In fact, 
After being introduced to this approach, it becomes difficult to imagine that any other way of defending oneself from the government would be effective. Having said that, I feel obliged to point out that one of the most difficult aspects of dealing with a licensed attorney, even a good one, may be knowing whose side he is on. In parentheses, after all, he is an officer of the court. So for those of us who have concluded that having an attorney means that you will soon be chained, gagged, and led to the gallows, this information may be indispensable. For the extraordinary challenges of appearing in court in one's own person, pro per, there are few reliable sources of information, learning to defend ourselves, that is, being responsible, instead of turning one more area of our lives over to professionals, may be the only way to have any chance of digging ourselves out of legal tyranny. Perhaps the greatest problem we face in education today is the matter of widespread legal illiteracy. Naturally, there will always be a number of people who just don't care about these issues who either, one, have a soft life supported and maintained by the secret system of institutions and law which has grown up around us. In parentheses, I can make a bundle buying these IRS seized homes cheap and reselling them. Two, don't believe that anything can be done about it. In parentheses, you can't fight City Hall. Three, don't have the energy or inclination to do anything about it. In parentheses, that's nice. But let's see what's on TV. For those good citizens, this whole effort may seem useless or even threatening. But it is this writer's view that God did not intend for us to spend our lives in statutory slavery for the benefit of a handful of secret world manipulators, even if the masters grant us some token of diversions and pleasure. Human dignity requires much more than entertainment. The door is there and the key exists. We must find it and we must use it to return to freedom. Let us discover the mistakes we have made. Let us find the truth. Let us apply it with meekness and wisdom. And let us gently but firmly reclaim the precious liberty and freedom which we have so foolishly given up. Well, there you have it, the UCC Connection. There is also a list of other publications available from the Common Law Grand Jury website, nationallibertyalliance.org. If you found this information useful, I recommend contacting us for a list of our materials. We hope we didn't put it all in this effort only for someone to say, yeah, that's on the internet. We tried to find stuff like this for some time now, and other than John Freeman's articles, we found none. Also, we like the author's approach here. Many of the so-called patriot organizations seem to be more profiteers than patriots. We understand that bills need to be paid, but after reading lists and lists of products available for X amount of dollars, we see this pamphlet as a little different. Good luck and God bless. The UCC Connection. I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And a few more quotes. When even one American, in parentheses, who has done nothing wrong, is forced by fear to shut his mind and close his mouth, then all Americans are in peril. In parentheses, former President Harry Truman. In the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man, brave, hated, and scorned. When his cause succeeds, however, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. In parentheses, Mark Twain. Truth is less than truth until it is made known. John Wheeler. In memory of Harold Freeman, who left us in 1992. Special stuff you should know. Taking your birth certificate to court. The courts only want to charge some bogus bonds to your federal account, and they need your bond or permission to do the discharge. Otherwise, you must pay a fine and go to jail. But they neglected to tell us that the birth certificate is the bond, and the birth certificate is proof that we are the beneficiary, 
and not the trustee of our straw man trust account. The state is the trustee. Everything including crime and taxes is already prepaid through that birth certificate bond. In every case so far, the charges were settled and they let the fellow go without a record of crime by surrendering the birth certificate. Further, the birth certificate proves that you are the beneficiary of your straw man estate. The prosecutor is claiming that he represents the beneficiary, in parentheses the state, when the state is really supposed to be the trustee. So when you bring the birth certificate into court, you discharge all of the charges against you, and you prove that you are the beneficiary of your trust estate. And this completely shuts the prosecutor down. The prosecutor now has no standing. You bringing in the birth certificate proves that he has brought fraud into the court by claiming to be the beneficiary instead of you. Only the beneficiary, in parentheses you, can be the plaintiff. And only the trustee, in parentheses the state, can be the defendant. I do not give legal advice, but this is what I would do if I were in your shoes. How to proceed. 1. Take a certified copy of your birth certificate, in parentheses certified by state, to court with you. Do not make a copy, or it is void. Do not mark on it or it is void. 2. Write down what you are going to say. You will be nervous and forgetful. 3. When they call your name, walk up to the bar, but do not cross it. If it is a court of record, ask them, are we on the record? Once you are satisfied you're on the record, you can proceed. If they ask your name, ask again, are we on the record? In parentheses, if it's a misdemeanor, a lot of times there is no record, so just proceed. 4. Hand the birth certificate across the bar and say, I am here on special appearance. Let the record show that the person on the birth certificate has been surrendered to the court. If they will not come and take the birth certificate, then gently toss it across the bar into the well of the court. Note. A person is a legal fiction. You are a living soul. A living soul is not a person. Special appearance means that you are not given the court jurisdiction over you. 5. Then turn around and leave. Do not stop. Do not answer questions. When they say, hey you, stop, or you have a court date on such and such, just keep on going and get out. Do not respond. Do not come back. Do not let them bluff you into coming back. At the time of this writing, this approach has worked 100% of the time. However, about 5% of the folks who do this report that the court tries to threaten them with letters. The worst that may happen is that they send you a bill for whatever you're accused of and possibly the threat of an arrest warrant. Sometimes they'll send a letter with a new court date. And the very latest was a threat letter saying that there was an arrest warrant or threatening you with arrest if you do not come in to be arraigned. However, if they could have issued or served a warrant, they would have. So this has all been a bluff 100% of the time. Even if the letter that said there was an arrest warrant, in parentheses, there was one on record, but it was never processed or served. Bluff, bluff, bluff. If you receive any of these letters, mail them back with a regular letter stating that I reserve all of my rights per UCC 1-308 and I do not consent. Do not enter anything into the record or place a court heading at the top of your letter or that will be giving consent. A regular letter only. Only once has anyone reported being grabbed while leaving the court and this man was still successful in leaving without prosecution. Alternate Method Simply telling the court that I reserve all of my rights per UCC 1-308, and they would immediately let you go before, but not anymore. They keep coming against you, trying to trick you into their jurisdiction, which most people fall for. Filing documents into their court and motion gives them jurisdiction, so they take the opportunity to deny everything and keep on working against you. However, 
UCC 1-308 is the remedy to the courts, so it is a matter of figuring out how to apply it without giving jurisdiction. The following method is almost the same as the birth certificate method above. The Alternative Process 1. Take a certified copy of your birth certificate, in parentheses certified by the state, to court with you. Do not make a copy, or it is void. Do not mark on it, or it is void. 2. Write down what you are going to say. You will be nervous and forgetful. 3. When they call your name, you walk up to the bar, but do not cross it. If it is a court of record, ask them, Are we on the record? Once you are satisfied that you are on the record, you can proceed. If they ask your name, ask again, Are we on the record? In parentheses, if it is a misdemeanor, a lot of times there is no record, so just proceed. 4. Then say, I am here on special appearance. Let the record show that I, in parentheses, first name only, reserve all of my rights per UCC 1-308 and do not consent. 5. Then turn around and leave. Do not stop. Do not answer any questions. When they say, hey you, stop. Keep on going and get out. The following is a suggested way to handle the situation for the one fellow that might get grabbed. Do not resist if they lay hands on you and force you into the well of the court. If they do, do not answer to any name. If they say, Mr. whatever your name is, while talking to you, say, I am not that person. I am the beneficiary and I reserve all of my rights per UCC 1-308. The judge may start asking you questions like, Who are you? Your name and address, and etc. This is all a trick to get you into his jurisdiction. Once you give them your full name or address, they have you. Simply say, That is immaterial. I am the beneficiary, and I reserve all of my rights per UCC 1-308. If they ask what to call you, simply say, You can call me the beneficiary. If the judge threatens you with contempt for not giving your name or answering his questions, simply ask, can anything I say be used against me? They usually will not answer you or they may say, yes, then you remain silent. If he threatens you over and over, keep asking, can anything I say be used against me? Or you can answer, I do not understand. Sometimes they will take your ID from your wallet and ask you why your picture is on it. Say, that proves I am the beneficiary. Note, you had to show your birth certificate to get a social security number or driver's license because the birth certificate proves you are the beneficiary who can receive it. If the judge tries to find you in contempt for not answering, others reported only being held for a few hours as a scare tactic, then they were let go. They cannot do anything to you unless you give them your name and or address. Ever notice that a cop asks or yells, What is your name? In parentheses, they have to have your name to do anything to you. Then ask, Is the matter settled? They will try to hand the birth certificate back to you, but do not take it unless and until they say the matter is settled, excused, or something to that effect. If the judge leaves the courtroom, he is trying to restart the proceedings because you have won. So say, let the record show that the judge has abandoned the case, and now the case is closed with prejudice. And then leave. The only thing you may get is a nasty threat of a bench warrant in the mail or an order to pay a fine. But this would be only a trick. If they could do anything at all, there would be an arrest warrant the first day. I would make notes before I go in so you do not lose track of what you are doing. Once you get nervous, it's hard to remember everything. I always take my time and do not let them rush me. Talk slowly. They only do that to intimidate and to force you to make a mistake. Say, I do not understand, over and over again, regardless of the question. If you do not understand a question, do not answer it. Say, I do not understand. In fact, you can say this to any question the judge asks, such as what is your name? Court tricks. They sometimes start off offering plea bargains. The only way they can get you is to scare you into a plea. 
without jurisdiction, in parentheses, your permission, they have to let you go. I have seen this work in courts 100% of the time, but there can always be an exception. When you say, I do not understand, the judge will ask you leading questions like, do you understand English? Can you read English? And etc. If you answer yes, then he can assume that you do understand. Simply say, no, I do not understand. The judge may say, you answered me in English. You do understand. Say, I do not understand. I do not understand is a great way to answer everything after you tell him you are the beneficiary. And for the nervous types who cannot think under pressure, it is the best way to answer at all times, places, and circumstances. Rarely do folks get this hard of a time, but do prepare for it just in case. If you stick to your guns and not take a plea bargain, etc., charges have always been dismissed. If you are ever arrested for anything in the future, never give your name. Say you are not that person, but are the beneficiary and living soul. It used to be that they would hold you for 72 hours and then let you go if they could not get you to say your name or to take bail or bond. But now they can hold you up to 10 days and then offer you bail, bond, or return of your own recognizance. This is a trick if you accept the offer. You are then giving them jurisdiction. They have to let you go sometime after 10 days anyway. I am not that person, and it would be bond fraud for me to accept. Let me go. The judge will sometimes address you saying, Mr. Smith this and Mr. Smith that. If you answer to the name, then again, you are that person. The judge just tricked you into his jurisdiction. Simply say, I don't know who you are talking to. I am not that person, Mr. Smith. I am the beneficiary and I gave you the person per the birth certificate. Note, if you ever noticed when someone files a lawsuit, the court will dismiss the case saying that it was frivolous. What they are saying is that you cannot be the plaintiff because you are not the beneficiary, so always attach a copy of your birth certificate to the suit. All rights reserved, without prejudice. Without prejudice per UCC 1-308. All lawful reservations. Without prejudice per UCC 1-308. Above or below your signature on an instrument. Represents the following. It's not a promise to appear and eliminates perjury. Enforces the right to contract and the right to compromise in unconscionable contract. Reserves all applicable rights in Bill of Rights and Article Three Judicial Power under Common Law. Criminal intent must be brought forward to proceed. Uphold separation of powers. All terms constitutional dealing with contracts, judicial and taxes. Reserves personum jurisdictional issues. Estoppel of subject matter jurisdiction and summary admiralty. Not a sumset. Habeas corpus. Activating clause for police power at probable cause. Disrupts penumbra doctrine. Confession and avoidance. Miranda will be given for you to sign. Reserve your rights on the instrument by not becoming in personum at Rule 12b. Do not give up your personum to power of attorney because you waive rights with each admission or tactic response answered by person standing in your stead, which makes you in personum for accepting this benefit. Remain silent and the reservation will command you to justice. Without prejudice, UCC 1-308, above or below your signature, not only puts a condition on an unconditional contract, but also reserves all your rights under Article 3 Judicial. Voids police powers unless crime and probable cause exist. An unconstitutional statute, though having the form of law, is in reality no law and imposes no duties, confers no rights, creates no office, bestows no power on anyone and justifies no actions performed under it. In parentheses, American Jurisprudence, 2nd edition, 
Section 256. The graduated income tax, for example, is unconstitutional only if the citizen abates its color of law without prejudice to him. In parentheses, abate means put an end to its effect. Without prejudice serves notice upon any agent that you are not waiving any of your stated Bill of Rights. Beware of agency procedure and sign everything with the reservation to make the instrument non assumpted in parentheses, free of liability. Black's Law Definition, non assumpted The general issue in the action of assumpted being a plea by which the defendant affers, he did not partake, or promised as alleged. But whenever the judicial power is called into play, it is responsible to the fundamental law and no other authority can intervene to force or authorize the judicial body to disregard it. In parentheses, Yakis v. U.S. 321, U.S. 414, page 468, 1944. The officer may not know the law and will probably proceed with whatever forum is to be taken per his training instructions. He is a ministerial officer of the court and is given very little discretional knowledge. When our rights are violated by agency, we must cooperate with constitutional remedy and recourse. The agents must sign forms also, and these become a permanent record of the administrative process that will receive your judicial notice. Our state citizenship is brought forth along with our personum rights, which do not mingle well with statute procedure. The purpose of your court appearance would be to gain jurisdiction over your personum. I would suggest it for study purposes that you answer politely, that you do not understand the charges, and without prejudice, under Uniform Commercial Code 1-308, due to mistakes in fact and law, I wish to remain silent. The magistrate will have to be very constructive in his color of law procedure because his boundaries to engage you further are abated. Without contract or tactic, consent to the jurisdiction, their claim is finished. Remember, you are in an Article I inferior court brought by admiralty and the only power this court has over the sovereign citizen is to give remedy or take the issue to the grand jury for indictment under Article 3, if there is criminal intent. The Fifth Amendment states, No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless the presentment of a grand jury. If there is no victim and criminal intent, there is no crime. It may, however, be considered settled and letters or admissions containing the expression and substance that they are to be without prejudice will not be admitted in evidence. In arraignment stating that the letter was without prejudice was held to be inadmissible as evidence. Not only will the letter bearing the words without prejudice, but also the answer thereto, which was not so guarded, was inadmissible. In parentheses, Ferry v. Taylor, 33, M.O., 323, Durgan v. Summers, 117, Mass., 55, Molinex v. Collier, 13, G.A., 406. When we the people are put into a circumstance of compromise, the only viable solution relies on the Uniform Commercial Code and its direct link to the Constitution for these United States of America. Important. UCC 1-207 was moved to UCC 1-308 to hide it from the public. If all goes well, you may be put on a red flag list. There appears to be three red flag lists. 1. The judges list. Appears to be a list of people against whom the judge will not issue a warrant for arrest unless they cause injury. But the judge will still let the police ticket you or arrest you. Two. The state list, a list of people where there will not be no arrest warrants and where the police cannot arrest you or ticket you or detain you unless you are causing injury. You are only protected in the state that has put you on their list. If you move to another state and change the new state's ID, 
then you can get tickets and or be arrested. 3. The Federal List is like the state list, except that you are protected in all states and territories. However, you can no longer get on this list by sending a federal judge a letter of your reservation of rights. You have to sue your way onto this list and possibly appeal. How UCC 1-308 Works The U.S. Constitution establishes the court's jurisdiction as common law, equity, and admiralty under Article 3. As opposed to this, the Federal Corporation establishes a similar jurisdiction except under the Uniform Commercial Code. See UCC 1-103 Supplementary General Principles of Law Applicable. Unless displaced by the particular provisions of this Act, the principles of law and equity, including the law merchant and the law relative to capacity to contract, principle and agent, estoppel, fraud, misrepresentation, duress, coercion, mistake, bankruptcy, or other validating or invalidating cause shall supplement its provisions. Anytime you see law by itself, as in the foregoing, it means the common law, except that they are taking the common law jurisdiction from the contract UCC. The remedy, of course, is UCC 1-308. So the UCC is a deceptive criminal contractual constitution of sorts to those who use it against us. UCC 1-308 is the remedy for any legal process under commercial law in the United States. The UCC 1-308 Performance or Acceptance Under Reservation of Rights A. A party that with explicit reservation of rights performs or promises performance or assents to performance in a manner demanded or offered by the other party does not thereby prejudice the rights reserved. Such words as without prejudice, under protest, or the like are sufficient. Since the federal corporation is just that, a corporation, it has no jurisdiction except with those that contract with it. Also see Congressional Act of 1871 and 28 U.S.C. 3002, Part 6, Chapter 176, Subchapter 176, Subsection A, 15, United States means a federal corporation. The states illegally contracted with the federal corporation by passing the Uniform Commercial Code, making themselves as well as the unsuspecting people subject to the federal corporation and also to the states and their new commercial capacities. The Uniform Commercial Code creates the corporate state of the United States, the federal corporation, as opposed to the several de jure states of the Union. In parentheses, UCC 1-201, General Definitions 38, State Means, State of the United States. As opposed to the several states of the Union, USC Title 28, Part 6, Chapter 176, Subchapter A, Statute 3002, Definitions 14, State Means, Any of the Several States. Because the states accepted and passed the Uniform Commercial Code, they converted state citizens into persons, in parentheses, legal entities, articles of commerce, and the states into vessels of the United States, placing the states and state citizens under maritime law. USC Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 1, Statute 9, Vessel of the United States Defined. The term, Vessel of the United States, as used in this title, means a vessel belonging in whole or in part to the United States, or any citizen thereof, or any corporation created by or under the laws of the United States, or of any state, territory, district, or possession thereof. Therefore, all laws, in parentheses, color of law, are contractual commercial laws, and the remedy is UCC 1-308. The Uniform Commercial Code makes all crimes commercial only by contract as per 27 CFR 72.11. The problem is that only the higher courts will recognize the remedy. 
However, the remedy should legally and always be given without delay, on demand, or claim. This, of course, is the problem. The misdemeanor courts do not have a clue as to where their jurisdiction comes from, and neither do magistrates. You have to get in front of a court with a real judge that tries felonies. The courts try to sting you along under duress of threat, hoping that you can be scared into a plea. But in the end, they have to honor the remedy. 27 CFR 72.11 Disposition of Seized Personal Property Table of Contents Subpart B Definitions Commercial Crimes Any of the following types of crimes in parentheses federal or state Offenses against revenue laws Burglary Counterfeiting Forgery Kidnapping Larceny Robbery Illegal sale or possession of deadly weapons Prostitution, in parentheses, including soliciting, procuring, pandering, white slaving, keeping house of ill fame, and likewise offenses. Extortion, swindling, and confidence games, and attempting to commit, conspiring to commit, or compounding any of the foregoing crimes. Addiction to narcotic drugs and use of marijuana will be treated as if such were commercial crime. 1938, April 25th, the Supreme Court overturned the standing precedents of the prior 150 years concerning common law and the federal government. In parentheses, because there is no longer silver or gold coin as Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. There is no federal common law, and Congress has no power to declare substantive rules of common law applicable in a state, whether they be local or or general in their nature, be they commercial law or a part of law of torts. Erie Railroad Company v. Tompkins, 304 U.S. 64 82 L E D dot 1188. The common law is the fountain source of substantive and remedial rights, if not our very liberties. The members and associates of the bar thereafter formed committees and granted themselves special privileges, immunities, and franchises, and held meetings concerning judicial procedures, and further, to amend laws to conform to a trend of judicial decisions or to accomplish similar objectives, including hodgepodging the jurisdictions of law and equity together, which is known today as one form of action. In parentheses, see Constitution and Bylaws, Article 3, Section 3.3, three, C, 1990 through 91, Reference Book, also Colorado Methods of Practice, West Publishing, Volume 4, pages 2 through 3, Author's Comments. 1939, ABA, the American Bar Association gets more involved in approval of uniform law products. 39 acts are presented to the Board of Governors of the American Bar Association for consideration and approval. During the same year, all acts on aeronautics and motor vehicles are eliminated, as well as the Land Registration Act, Child Labor Act of 1930, Uniform Divorce Jurisdiction Act, Firearms Act, Marriage Act, and more. Six acts are reclassified as model acts. 1940. At start of the decade after deletions, etc., 53 acts out of 93, which had been approved since the group's founding, remain on the books. Drafting Committee for the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC approved. 1941. Speaking of the Commercial Code Project, the conference president states, this is the most important and the most far-reaching project on which the conference has ever embarked. It would take the major part of the next 10-year period to complete. 1942. UCC effort begins in earnest with completion of work on the revised Uniform Sales Act. 1943. Members of the conference participate in the drafting committee in Washington, D.C. to work on legislation which the government might desire in connection with the war effort. No new acts. 1944. Conference receives 
$150,000 grant from the Falk Foundation of Pittsburgh to support the work on the UCC. 1955. No annual meeting for the first time due to difficulties of civilian transport during the war. 1946. Falk Foundation increases its support of the UCC with an additional $100,000. 1947. Uniform Law Conference, the ULC, and American Law Institute, ALI, join in partnership to put all the components together for the UCC, Uniform Divorce Recognition Act approved. 1955. Approval of the Uniform Marriage License Application Act, Uniform Adoption Act, and the Uniform Reciprocal Enforcement of Support Act the U-R-E-S-A. The latter has been one of the most successful ULC products. 1951, May 18th, during a joint meeting with the American Law Institute in Washington, D.C., the UCC was approved. Later that year, the ABA formally approved the code as well, considered the outstanding accomplishment of the conference. The code remains the ULC's signature product. As one of the uniform laws drafted by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws and the American Law Institute Governing Commercial Transactions, in parentheses, including sales and leasings of goods, transfer of funds, commercial paper, bank deposits and collections, letters of credit, bulk transfers, warehouse receipts, bills of lading, investment securities, and secured transactions. The Uniform Commercial Code has been adopted in whole or substantially by all states. In essence, all court decisions are based on commercial law or business law with criminal penalties associated with it. Rather than openly calling this new law admiralty forward slash maritime jurisdiction, it is called statutory jurisdiction. America is a bankrupt nation owned completely by its creditors. The creditors own the Congress. They own the executive, they own the judiciary, and they own all of the state's governments. Do you have a birth certificate? They own you too. Last note, the 14th Amendment creates a lower class of citizen, citizen of the United States, rather than the higher class of citizen, citizen of one of the several states of the Union. The remedy provided to the 14th Amendment is an act by Congress known as 15 U.S. Statute at Large, July 27, 1868, one day before the 14th Amendment took effect, also known as the Expatriation Statute. This is your remedy to claim being a natural citizen of your state. This makes you a higher citizen and no longer subject to the Article 4 loophole that deprives you of your rights. In parentheses, gone is the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. The Uniform Commercial Code is a private international law that is owned by Unidroit. Does the UCC apply to you? The body of learning we call conflict of laws is called private international law because it pertains to private interests, while public international law pertains to relations between the states. In parentheses, Garner v. Teamsters, Chauffeurs and Helpers Local Union, 346 U.S. 485, 495, 98 L E D 228 74 S C T 116. In the sense of the public international law, the several states of the Union are not foreign to the United States, nor are they foreign to each other. But such is not the case in the field of private international law. In parentheses, Robin v. Norato 71 R I 256 43 A 2 D 467 162 Capital A L R 362. The Uniform Commercial Code by the copyright owner's own admission is private international law. In other words, the 50 United States of the Union are publicly united with each other while privately foreign to the United States. In other words, private international law pertains to private interests and public international law pertains to public relations between states. To simplify the events that caused the confusion of public is private and private is public. We include the following. The first connection from the highest potent position is that 
A. 77 statute, 630 through 631, P.L.88, hyphen, 243, 1963, and P.L.84 through 244, 1963, makes the Uniform Commercial Code private law for the Municipal District of Columbia and the Federal United States. These statutory laws, forward slash actions, expressly affect citizens of the federal government. 77 Statute 630 through 631, P.L.88 243, is an act that enacts the Uniform Commercial Code for the District of Columbia and for other purposes. This is where the UCC functions as the law of the land for the federal government, in parentheses, District of Columbia and Territories. For sake of simplicity, public law, in parentheses, P.L.88-244, is private law for private corporate citizens and not for the people. 1. A private law is confined to particular individuals, associations, or corporations, in parentheses, 50, American Jurisprudence, 12, page 28. 2. A private law can be enforced by a court of competent jurisdiction when statutes for its enforcement are enacted. In parentheses, 20, American Jurisprudence, 33, pages 58 and 59. 3. Statutes creating corporations are private acts. In parentheses, 20, American Jurisprudence, 35, page 60. 4. In this connection, the Federal Reserve Act is private law. Federal Reserve Banks derive their existence and corporate power from the Federal Reserve Act. In parentheses, Armano v. Federal Reserve Bank, 468 F. Sup. 674, 1979. 5. The distinction between public acts and private acts is not always sharply defined when published statutes are printed in their final form. In parentheses, Case v. Kelly, 133, U.S., 21, 1890. B. It is all private law and international law, in parentheses, but may be referred to as private international law, and it is owned by the same people that own public law, 88-243, 1968. The UCC was written and is owned by Unidroit. International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, which is located within the Vatican, about 100 yards from the Holy See. 1. To properly address public law, one must understand that a private corporate charter owns public law, and public law is statutory. Public law was converted to public policy in 1938. In parentheses, Policy equals political equals police. All private corporations, in parentheses fictions, including governments, are under public policy and can only deal with other corporations, in parentheses fictions. 2. Private man is not affected by public law, private law, or public policy. As long as private man does not harm another private man, he is not statutory, but lawful. 3. Public means of concerning or affecting the common unity of the people, the assemblage of private man. 4. Private means not available for public use, control, or participation, belonging to a particular person or persons, as opposed to the public or the government. In parentheses, remember, as a corporation, the government becomes no more than any other corporate person, not holding an official or public position. 5. The entire taxing and monetary systems are hereby placed under the UCC, in parentheses, the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966. C. The U.S. pays $260,000 per year to Unidroit for the use of the copyrighted UCC. The International Registry is the public law of Unidroit, and since the United States has signed on to the Unidroit Statute, in parentheses, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, all of which is incorporated herein by reference in its entirety, which is all about private international law, which is another name for the Uniform Commercial Code. 
On page six, legislative activities, the first item is principles of the international commercial contracts. And on page 10, it shows 1955 Benelux Treaty on compulsory insurance against civil liability in respect of motor vehicles. And 1958 Convention concerning the recognition and enforcement of decisions relating to maintenance obligations towards children. In parentheses, Hague Conference on Private International Law. Unijoint is owned and operated by the Vatican, and they intend to enforce their religious ceremony on the millions of people on the land in America and elsewhere in the world. This is further proof that the corporation called the United States is owned and operated by the Vatican to further their agenda, and they are using their commercial law to enforce their martial law. No law compels a private sector, non-governmentally privileged work-eligible man or woman to submit a W-4 or W-9 form, in parentheses or their equivalents, nor to obtain or disclose a social security number as a condition of being hired or of keeping his job, with the exception of an order from a court of competent jurisdiction issued by a duly qualified judge. No amounts can be lawfully taken from one's pay, in parentheses, for taxes, fees, or other charges, without the worker's explicit, intentional, knowing, voluntary, written consent. It is the manner of enforcement which gives Title 42, 1983 its unique importance. The enforcement is placed in the hands of the people. Each citizen acts as a private attorney general who takes on the mantle of the sovereign, guarding for all of us the individual liberties enunciated in the Constitution. Frankenhauser v. Rizzo, 59 FRD, 1973. Section 9. Assassination. Section 9. Assassination. 148. The law of war does not allow proclaiming either an individual belonging to the hostile army, or a citizen, or a subject of the hostile government an outlaw, who may be slain without trial by any captor, or any more than the modern law of peace allows such international outlawry. On the contrary, it abhors such outrage. The sternest retaliation should follow the murder committed in consequence of such proclamation made by whatever authority civilized nations look with horror upon offers of rewards for the assassination of enemies as relapses into barbarism. The laws of Congress in respect to those matters do not extend into the territorial limits of the states, but have force only in the District of Columbia and other places that are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the national government. C.A.H.A. verse U.S. 152, U.S. 211, 1894. Under the laws of commerce, truth is sovereign. The foundation of the Uniform Commercial Code is commercial law. The foundation of commercial law is based upon certain universal eternally just, valid, moral precepts and truths. The basis of commercial law is the law of Exodus of the Old Testament, i.e. the Ten Commandments, and the Judaic Orthodox Hebrew commercial law of Moses. The laws of commerce, unchanged for at least 6,000 years, form the basis of Western civilization, if not all nations of the world. Therefore, commercial law applies universally throughout the world. Commercial law is non-judicial. It is prior to, superior to, and the basis of, in angle bracket parentheses, and cannot be set aside or overruled by, the statutes of any government, legislator, governmental, or quasi-governmental agencies, courts, judges, and law enforcement agencies, all of which are under an inherent obligation to uphold said commercial law. Commercial law is a war of truth expressed in the form of an intellectual weapon called an affidavit. An affidavit is simply a written list of facts or truths signed under the penalty of perjury and usually notarized. The person making and signing an affidavit is called the affiant. It is survival of the fittest where the last unrebutted affidavit stands triumph as the truth. 10 Maxims of Commercial Law
1. A workman is worthy of his hire. Exodus chapter 20 verse 15. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 13. Matthew chapter 10 verse 10. Luke chapter 10 verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6. It is against equity for free men not to have the free disposal of their own property. 2. All are equal under the law. Exodus chapter 21, verse 23 through 25. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17 through 21. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 19, verse 21. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 25. No one is above the law. Commerce, by the law of nations, ought to be common, and not be converted into a monopoly for the private gain of a few. 3. In commerce, truth is sovereign. Exodus, chapter 20, verse 16. Psalm, chapter 117, verse 2. John, chapter 8, verse 32. Second Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 8. To lie is to go against the mind. Oriental proverb. Of all that is good, sublimity is supreme. 4. Truth is expressed in the form of an affidavit. Leviticus, chapter 5, verse 4 through 5. Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. Numbers, chapter 30, verse 2. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 33. James, chapter 5, verse 12. 5. An unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in commerce. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 25. Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 13 through 15. He who does not deny, admits. 6. An unrebutted affidavit becomes judgment in commerce. Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 16 through 17. Any proceeding in court, tribunal, or arbitration form consists of a contest or duel of commercial affidavits wherein the remaining points not rebutted in the end stand as the truth of the matters to which the judgment of law is applied. 7. A matter must be expressed to be resolved. Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 16. Philemon, chapter 4, verse 5. Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. He who fails to assert his rights has none. 8. He who leaves the field of battle first loses by default. In parentheses does not respond to the affidavit. Job. Matthew chapter 10 verse 22. He who does not repel a wrong when he can occasions it. 9. Sacrifice is the measure of credibility. Acts chapter 7. Life and death of Stephen. He who bears the burden ought to derive the benefit. One who is not damaged, put at risk, or willing to swear an oath on his commercial liability for the truth of his statements and the legitimacy of his actions, has no basis to assert charges or claims, and forfeits all credibility and right to authority. 10. A lien or claim can be satisfied only through a rebuttal by counter-affidavit point by point, b. resolution by a jury, or c. payment or performance of the claim. Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, Matthew chapter 4, and the whole book of Revelations. If the plaintiff fails to prove his case, the defendant is absolved. Because truth is sovereign in commerce, and everyone is responsible for propagating the truth in all their speaking, writing, and acting. All commercial processes function by affidavits, certified under oath to be true, correct, not misleading, and complete. On each affiant's commercial liability regarding all matters stated and likewise demanded, in written matters, on nearly every document that those who run the system desire that you sign, your signature is presumed to be under penalty of perjury. In a court setting, 
However, testimony, in parentheses, an oral commercial affidavit, is sworn to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. The participation must provide material evidence, i.e. ledgering, forward slash bookkeeping, proving that each fact or entry is true, valid, verifiable, and relevant. Without the acceptance of liability in support of one's assertions, no credibility is established.